too early to, to say, isn't it? It's, um, you know, I, I picked up various, uh, I won't mention uh, you know, whose articles they were, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, every time I pick it up, it's, it's a different one, whether it's Karen Clark, whether it's RMS, whether it's whoever. Uh, everything's got such a huge range to it as well. Um, so I think we'll be here you know, in, in, in three months time still scratching our head. And if you go back to Katrina as well, if you remember some of the uh, initial estimates that people were putting out, they probably doubled by the end of the uh, you know, three to six months. So it's, it's got a long way to go yet. Yeah. I, I think that's something we need to recognise is that the ILS market is not a temporary thing that's going to go away and we'll get back to a re regular uh, reinsurance environment. ILS is with us and, it's, and even though the returns aren't great, they're much better than what the, the, they can get outside of the insurance linked securities uh, environment. And uh, that over capacity will be with us. And that will lead, I think the traditional uh, market cycle that we've been used to for all our careers, I'm not gonna say it's gonna go away, but it's not gonna be the same uh, market cycle that we've experienced. You know, for, but at the same time, I, I keep I keep hearing this word the new norm, and I don't agree with that either, because ultimately, yeah, managements will look at individual product lines. You know, EMP is such a uh, depleted income. You know, I, if, we go, if we go back to three or four years ago, we probably had four to five billion dollars within the industry. I'd be amazed if we had over a billion dollars now. And, and the, the, the limits we, we're writing are getting higher and higher. Yeah. The risks are getting more uh, complicated. We're getting deeper water. We're getting high pressure, high temperature. So yeah, it's, it's no. It, it will have to change because we'll get more complicated claims. I'm sure yeah. you're seeing that in your. Field. And well, the reality is, it's not just the more complex stuff now where we're starting to see claims materialize. It comes back to what you talked about, which was inexperienced players and people making commercial decisions. And so. We're seeing risks that normally are very well understood. So, um, you know, scrap toes, things that are entirely preventable going wrong because people are making these commercial decisions. And of course, we've got things that are more and more complex, deeper water, um, particularly in the upstream energy sector. But it, the reality is some of the biggest exposure is now lying on the bread and butter stuff because we've got inexperienced people, new players moving into the game, and that's everywhere we talk about maybe inexperienced junior underwriters, but you'll see the same thing even in the marine warranty surveying sector is you'll see um, break off companies or, or new players that are frankly winning the work, um, local, local people that are frankly just inexperienced, but they're winning the work based on rates. And, and so if you look at a lot of the high profile claims, even the, the stuff that was being discussed through the conference, um, a lot of these are entirely preventable and not even really complex risks. So I, I think you're right, I don't think it's the new norm at all. I think what we're going to see is that at some point, the pendulum's going to have to start to swing the other way. And I think that the only the only thing our industry cannot realize right now is that this new norm doesn't come from the industry itself. It comes from the financial market that has never been in such a shape ever before. Now, if you talk, if you take the example of you know the the oil price itself, we now say, oh, you know, we want to get back to the levels where it used to be. Well, we should think not the levels of you know 2008, 2009, 2010, or you know whatever when it was at the you know hundred plus. What we should look at is probably the beginning of, of this new you know century and the price that was there, which was thirty dollars, forty dollars. Well, this was the norm. We inflated the price a lot, which made it possible for all these complex projects. Yeah. Now we're back to the norm, to the actual norm, or the, not the new norm, but the, the old norm. And back to this norm, the old norm, to the old norm. Yeah, exactly. We went back to the old norm, and now we suddenly discovered that there are actually two things. One is, we cannot, uh, you know, the, all those complex projects are not feasible, right. and there is no economic reason for, for them to, you know, to be actually materialized. Yeah. Now, what we're going to see, this is just my personal, Thing. And what we're going to see, we're going to see more of, you know, like you said, you know, bread and wine, ABC stuff. Yeah. So people want to cut costs and they want to become more efficient. And to do that, you just need to drill the same old wells, the same old fashioned way, to make sure that your profit margin is at the level that is possible to your shareholders. This is one thing. And to Matt's point, I totally agree with this. The problem with the industry, with the IRS, you know, sidecars, so every, you know, hedge funds pouring money into the industry is that. 
they have very slim volatility elsewhere. This industry is actually very good volatility because you can have you know, prosper years and then you have two, three hurricanes and you can bet not only investing money in you know, something not happening, but they can at the same time invest money in something actually happening. So for them, this industry is the, probably the best place to be right now. Yeah, so, so you want to see the industry grow as a result of cheap money? Uh, well, I it's penetrate in, more of the underlying industry. It's interesting that we actually don't see this happening. And again, this is just my, yeah. my very humble opinion. The only reason why we don't see this, because we as underwriters, you know, the old same corporate fund writers, we look at the risk that A, we know, yes. and B, we have some experience with. Now, the problem is, if you look at the Swiss Wheel report from 2016, they say, okay, so we have this influx of money, a lot of cash pouring into the industry, but if you take the percentage of the GDP of the uninsured loss every year, it's still at 20 basis points. So we have more and more money invested in the same thing instead of the new things. So now you're, you're calling in, you know, between, between well, these I two think, things. I think, I think that's where the industry needs to start to focus more to, to actually realize those, those untapped opportunities. But I think that it's still important <clears throat> to recognize that, because uh, I agree with you, I don't think oil prices are gonna go back up to $114 per barrel. That's not gonna happen. Not in the US. No, but, <laughs> but, there's, but there are still complex projects happening. If you look at FLNG and, and some of these you know, major projects that are happening that are underway right now, there's still a tremendous amount of exposure and very you know, complex project. But again, I agree with you, is that it's a lot of the bread and butter work that I think that's giving some of the exposure. You look at these scrap toes, those are not complex. And there, as a result of these these lower oil prices, um, you know, there's folks that are saying now that these cold rice, cold stack drinks will never come back online. And as we continue to have, um, you know, costs being controlled the way that they are, and people trying to just recover uh, or whatever they've invested in these units, whether it's by trying to scrap the units and, and undertake unmanned wet tows and mobile offshore drilling units. I mean, we're seeing even Buscellus now, um, where they have, you know, some of their vessels going to scrap and then load it up with stuff that needs to go to scrap. And in itself, is, is not like really a revenue generating operation, but it's still complex. You've got a ship going to scrap that it's at the end of its life cycle and then loaded with assets that are also going to scrap. And, and, uh, and we're seeing more and more claims coming from that. And interestingly, some of the more sophisticated stuff, uh, we're, we're not seeing the claims manifest from a lot of these you know, highly challenging complex FLNG projects that are happening around the world. Don't you think that there is you know, no reason for this happening? And the only, the only, the only way to explain this, the way I see, is that you have managers in those companies that try to justify the valuation of the, of the, of the share, of the share yeah. price. So they say, we have this risk of projects because we need more valuation, because the risk can be asset, the more valuation we have, so we make our shareholders happier. Yeah. There is no reason why this should sustain and why this is you know, feasible in the long run. It's just people trying to keep their seats and make sure that it looks nice. And yeah, so, so what we need is more educated shareholders. Uh, <laughs> not happening. It, 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 it applies to pretty much any, any time of history. Hey, what's your view? What's your well, on, the, on the retail broker side, we see a lot of uh, you know, what you're talking about with, with the, the capital coming into the energy industry. You know, we call it smart money and dumb money, and a lot of times the smart money will come in to, you know, the, and it's, it ebbs and flows like any cycle, but the smart money will come in and invest in projects that are high value but high return, uh, and then you have dumb money that sort of follows it, and it follows it into uh, basically fire sale deals right now, we're seeing that on the shelf, you know, as the majors and the more sophisticated independents pull back, either they're either going to deep water, and ultra deep water, or they're pulling back on, to, on shore, you've got all these assets on the shelf that are sort of upper grabs, cheap, nobody wants them, so you've got some players coming in and buying them. And they're buying these old assets, they don't really know what they're doing, they hire management teams, it's, it's you know, the, the old crew change issue, you know, they hire management teams, I'm 44, and a lot of them are younger than I am. So they haven't been through the cycles. There's nothing, not not to say that they're not intelligent people, but yeah. they're not experienced. They haven't seen the cycle. So first, I'll use an example. We have a, a, a challenging client. I'll put it that way. 
Uh, they've got some old work boats as part of their operator. They've got some old work boats as part of their fleet. And they don't, they're like, we're sick of doing these warranty surveys every year. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Can you find another market that doesn't require the warranty surveys? You probably can. And, <laughs> What's that? You probably can. can. I can, but I'm very reluctant to even go that way as they're, they don't have a risk manager. And so as their advisor, you know, my team and I are just like, you know, you need to, you need to do this. And there's a good reason for this. And to, to stop a loss before it happens, you need to be proactive. It's like, well, we're sick of paying for it. So, I mean, we're, we're still going through that. It's not that they're complete jerk offs or anything, but it's, it's a, um, it's a challenge because you have uneducated and somewhat inexperienced. I think intellectually they get it, but they haven't seen it. They haven't seen things go wrong. And when yeah. things go wrong in this industry, they can go very wrong, as we all know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's actually an indication of looking at that particular issue as a cost line rather than actually that's something it. that's, you know, risk is an embedded strategic opportunity or risk. Absolutely. And you can't just, you can't, I mean, it would be cheaper in the, in the long run to actually have the surveys done because they're supposed to highlight issues. Yeah. And if you're not doing the boo is. Uh, Come back to what you were saying, Ted. I'm actually quite excited about the offshore industry. The insurance industry, I'm not very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> the actual oil and gas industry. And, and the reason, reason I am is, you know, you talk about oil price, and you're probably right. 50 bucks is probably a, a good price now. Because these guys will go in and they've uh, you know, renegotiated a lot of their contracts. So they can extract oil for 25 bucks now, whereas if you'd gone 12 months ago, it would have been 50 bucks and there was no, there was no, um, there was no profit in it. You know, I was looking at an article yesterday, one of our clients has just got a rig, it was $470,000 last year, uh, a day rate, it's now 170000 So if you put that into the yes. equation, they're going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. well, the chops, yep. What we're seeing in the North Sea in particular, we're seeing a lot of private equity coming in and buying some of the, and they're not necessarily, uh, excuse my French, crap uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. They're just platforms that the majors, as you say, they, they want to go and they want big tickets in Africa and deep in right. place. Yeah. So it's actually good news for the insurance because these are guys who are actually going to buy insurance, they need insurance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I find those clients a little bit more transparent. They don't tend to tender as much. So actually, yeah. there's quite a lot of new opportunities mm -hmm. for you know, on an area which we need new income into the market because we said you know, it's depleted so much. 